Yeah, hello, welcome everybody um, to the I for content creation workshop. Um, I'm going to talk about 3D scanning for content creation today. And as many of you know, of course, um, me and my group, we have, we have been working on 3D reconstructions for quite a while right now. And this is an example from Bundle Fusion here. And this is like typically what 3D scans look like today. And here we see um, this 3D reconstruction. Um, it's a top-down view of my former office here at Stanford. And the thing is, we would love to use these three constructions as content in movies, in video games, and stuff like that. And we would love to scan everything, we would love to digitize everything, and we would love to scan our environments in virtual worlds. Now the big problem, of course, in that is if you have, you know, used these kind of scans, they look good from one perspective, like here, there's a few holes, um, but if you're changing the viewpoint, you're often going to get reconstructions that look like these ones. And this is a big problem, actually, in practice, um, because, you know, no matter how hard you try to scan everything in a 3D environment or in a 3D room, um, you're just not going to get everything. You're just going to always miss some parts and you're going to have some holes. Aside from the fact that it's noisy, you also always end up with this incomplete geometry. And this is just also based on the physical limitations of the sensor, right? The Kinect, for instance, has a minimum range um, and you you can't necessarily get anywhere, and especially under a table, it's pretty hard to get uh, in order to get all the 3D scans. So one of the thoughts, of course, is can we go ahead and can we complete these 3D scenes or 3D objects um, using generative neural networks? And one of the ideas here is that we wanted to start very simple right now. I don't want to deal with a large uh, scan. One of the first projects we've been doing, we actually looked at the completion of objects, and this is actually a project we've been doing like three, four years ago. Um, CNN complete. Um, this was one of the first projects actually that used neural networks to do shape completion. And the idea is that we, uh, we're going ahead and having two parts here. We're having a network that does some completion and then we have some traditional method that does refinement on top of it. But the interesting thing is the completion network here. This is basically a unit autoencoder, nothing too complicated. Um, but what's interesting about it is the representation. In this case, we're using a 32 cube voxel grid that stores a distance field plus an observed state. So the observed state is the sign of the distance field. And if that sign is negative, then it means it hasn't been observed yet. And this representation is actually directly given by 3D reconstruction methods um, that we can uh, directly use in order to generate that input data. And then the output here is a distance field without the sign, meaning that everything that was unobserved and had a negative sign, we wanted to make a prediction such that it is complete at the end of the day. Right? And this is a 3D continent. It's an encoder-decoder structure. It's a unit. It has skip connections. Um, and we do a couple of um, fancy things around it. We have a 3D classification network to give us additional classification features. We concatenate these. And this is what the reconstruction gets us at the end. Now, if you're looking at these reconstruction results here, uh, we have here the respective input, which you can see is, you know, quite partial. Um, and here are the respective completions, and here's the respective ground truth, and this is done on shape and then on a per object basis. And you can see, well, these reconstructions, they actually look pretty decent, uh, and we're getting quite, quite good um, yeah, completion results here. Now, this was kind of one of the first proof of concept papers that we did at this point. Um, that, well, yeah, of course it works, right? We can, we can train generative models. There was nothing fancy, no GAN, no autoregressive network at this point. Um, but the most important thing, what we were missing at this point, this was on a per object basis. And the question is, how do we do this on an entirety of the scenes? Um, and there's another question, actually. Um, this was trained on synthetic data. How would we apply this on real scans? Um, which is something that is, of course, um, having to deal with the domain transfer problem here. But let's have a look at the how do we do, deal with entirety of the scene first instead of single objects? And one problem is in 3D, um, you don't know how big the scenes are at test time, right? They could have basically any arbitrary size. And one thing we've been doing, um, this was um, uh, one work by, by Angela Dai here, the scan complete work, where we said, well, we have fully convolutional networks. And with fully convolutional networks, we can actually go ahead and train on crops of scenes and then test on entirety of the scenes at the very end of the day. And yeah, this was basically trained on these kind of crops, right? These were like a couple of cube meters big. Um, and we trained random crops of, of these large scenes. And, and then we're going ahead and be testing on the entirety of the scenes at the very end of the day. Okay. Um, and this way we can 
train on pretty much um, whatever fits into memory, and then we can test on the entirety scene in one forward pass. Um, and this is what we're getting here as an, as an output, right? We're having here the partial scan as input. We see here the close-up. This is a conference room, actually. And this is the respective completions that we're getting here um, as output. And the architecture, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, is an autoregressive architecture. It's not a GAN at this point. Um, so we're having basically eight networks um, that have different, uh, different voxel groups in this autoregressive network. We're training in a course-defined fashion, so we have a hierarchical prediction here, um, and we're getting actually these quite good results here on relatively large scenes. All right, so here's the input here, here's the respective completion, um, and we're also predicting the semantics in a separate head at the same time, um, so we get also semantic segmentation. One of the reasons why we did that actually was we thought, well, maybe the semantics is going to help our completion. Um, and we tried pretty hard to make that point. Um, it didn't help that much, um, maybe a little bit, but, but only barely. Um, but what turned out to be true is that the completion helped the semantics quite a bit. So if you have a completion output, that makes the semantics a lot better. So if you're ever thinking about like self-supervised representation learning, completion is a pretty good proxy task here. Yeah, we should probably write a paper about this one itself at some point. Um, but this is a, a finding that works actually uh, pretty well to learn these structures. You can do them for completion, um, and then they help the, the semantic features. Now, this one works relatively well, um, but one of the drawbacks here of this method is this one is trained on Sansu Chi, so a purely synthetic data set, um, and you would still have to deal with the domain transfer problem, right? So, training on synthetic, testing on real. Now, one thought is could we actually train or could we find a method that does it only on real data? And this is something we've presented last year at CVPR, the SGNN work. Um, and the idea is you can actually do self-supervised scan completion. Well, you might ask, how do you do self-supervised scan completion? Well, in this case, we're taking um, a set of depth frames as input from an RGBD scan. We're assuming we have the post alignments of these scans. So we ran some you know, reconstruction method here. In this case, we ran model fusion. Um, and now we have these frames. And if you're taking all of these frames together, and feeding them in the reconstruction method, we're going to get a final mesh as the output. So in this case here, we're going to get a certain target scan, right? Um, and in this target scan, you see we have the same problem what I mentioned before, right? We have a bunch of incomplete regions because we didn't see everything at the same time. But now the question is, can we use these scans here to devise a self-supervised method that learns the completion that goes beyond these kind of things here? And the self-supervised scan completion here works basically like taking these depth frames as input um, and removing some of the depth frames. So if we went ahead and from these five frames here, we're taking two frames out, these two frames, and we're getting an input scan then from the reconstruction that looks like this one. And we see that because we have fewer frames available right now, we actually have a less, part, a less complete scan than before you know, which kind of makes sense. So this kind of leaves us with the obvious um, idea here that this input scan and the target scan could be kind of correlated. And we could use this correlation as constraints in order to do the scan completion. And we thought about this and we thought, well, why don't we just train a network that takes this as input and tries to predict this one? Um, and this is how we started, actually, but it has one small drawback you're not going to get better than what you had originally. So now we thought about, is there a way to possibly constrain it such we can get better predictions than the target scan? And there's one unique property of these target scans that we have. Mainly, we know which parts in the target scans are generally unobserved. So when the sign here is negative in the reconstruction of this distance field, we know these are regions that we have never seen in the input. And this is what we're using as a masking now. So Instead of trying to say, convert this guy into that guy, we are saying, well, whenever you have known space here, try to predict from here what would be here in the known space. And whenever we have unobserved space, we actually masking these regions out. So for a given training scene, we only having partial constraints in all the known regions of the target. This is where we have these constraints. And in everything that is 
unobserved, we, we mask out the constraints and we don't use anything for training sample. But we're hoping that we're having similar patterns in other partial scans from other training samples, such that we could globally still learn to complete it. So at training, we mask it out. And at testing, we predict everything. And this one, we can train in a self-supervised fashion. right? So you only need a real 3D scan. You're taking a bunch of images out, a bunch of depth images out. And you just have these self-supervised constraints. And then you can get the reconstruction right. Uh, in addition to the self-supervised uh, scan completion idea for training, we also propose a sparse generative network. In this case here, we're having an input scan that is being encoded with a sparse encoder that then leads to a dense, uh, a dense kind of bottleneck-like uh, network part in the middle. And we have a sparse generative decoder to get the respective output. This is kind of like a, a sparse unit here, right? You have these skip connections here as well. Uh, but what we do now is, um, in this architecture, because it's sparse, we can get very, very high resolution outputs. And we can train this whole thing in a hierarchical fashion, meaning we first predict an occupancy grid here at a low resolution, occupancy grid at a higher resolution, occupancy grid at an even higher resolution, occupancy grid at an even higher resolution, and finally we predict the distance field at a very high resolution. And this idea, um, we can train this step by step. So we can first train this part, then we add a few more layers, we add this part, add a few more layers, add this part, add a few more layers, add this part, and so on. Right? Um, and this course to find training here actually helps quite a bit to stabilize the training process. And at the end of the day, um, we can go to very, very high resolutions while still maintaining um, these global structures. OK, so if you're looking at the input scan here, we're seeing the partial scans as input. And here we're seeing the reconstruction results of SGMM. And you see that these reconstructions, they actually look quite good. Um, so this was a paper we published last year at CVPR. And I would say it's still probably state of the art uh, in terms of the respective output qualities here. Um, so we're quite proud of this one. So for geometry, we're actually getting very, very high quality results. We only train on real uh, scenes, right? We have the self-supervised idea. We have this masking idea. Um, and this gives actually quite nice results. Uh, we also quantitatively evaluated, of course. So here we're comparing a couple of baselines. We compare against partial surface reconstruction, SSCNet, 3D EPN. You can also run this in a large scene. This, the autoregressive version of scan complete, and the SGNN work, which we just presented, has a significantly lower L1 error in terms of the reconstruction quality. And that's good. Um, but we also wanted to show an ablation study here. So one ablation study here is um, if you're looking at this masking versus not masking, right? So here we see the input, here we see the target. And if you're looking at these close-ups here, this is the input, it's very partial. And the target here is uh, relatively complete, but still misses a couple of things. So if you don't have the masking, you cannot complete more than the targets have, right? Because you're being trained to make it look like whatever the targets look like. But if we're masking, we actually get fairly complete reconstructions. And this one, if you look especially here and here, right, these reconstruction results are better than every single ground truth sample. And that's a very nice, um, that's a very, very nice property here for our reconstruction results. OK, so if we are looking um, at another ablation, here we are evaluating what's the varying degrees of the target incompleteness for training. So if we are checking here, um, these are different metrics, L1 on the entire thing, L1 observed, L1 predicted, L1 on target. Here we have three different degrees of varying completeness um, in the respective scans for training. right? And what's interesting about it, if you're going from 50% to all and versus 30% to 50%, it doesn't matter so much what the what this ratio is actually, which is kind of interesting, as long as it's randomized, right? It has to be randomized. But otherwise, it um, it doesn't really matter um, what the varying degrees of target incompleteness is for training, which is kind of a nice property. So we were actually pretty happy with this method, um, and we got pretty good results on the geometry. But the one thing we didn't look at was we didn't look at the color predictions. So we thought, what can we do? For better color prediction, or for, for generally for color completion as well, right? So we wanted to do self-supervised color scene generation um, in the same way what we have done for SGN right now. And this is a paper um, we've published at SPSG this year. 
Um, so what do we do here? Um, well, one question is, do we just add color actually um, to SGNN? Sounds easy, right? We have a voxel grid and we just add another variable uh, for like RGB um, for each voxel and we just have the same self-supervised idea what we had before. We tried it out uh, and it didn't work that well. And there's a very specific reason. The color signal is actually quite high frequency and even the respective target, you're not gonna you're not gonna get perfectly non-blurred results, right? And there's actually one thing for color that we're leaving on the table here. And for color, the idea is that we actually have the RGB input views, and each RGB input view is actually consistent in itself. I mean, you have every pixel has a value, and there's no hole in the image, right? Because you always see the frontmost pixel. And this is something what we're doing here uh, in this SPSG work where we're doing self-supervised color scene generation and we're using few guided synthesis. So in other words, what we're doing is we have an input scan, we're predicting a scan plus the color values. The color values are still per voxel, but now we're rendering these values into the respective target views and in the target views, we compare them with the respective input image that we've captured, right? Uh, and we can then, in 2D space, we can have a loss that makes sure that these ones look the same, right? Uh, and you can differentiate through the whole thing and jointly learn geometry in RGB uh, on a per voxel basis based on these reprojections. And in 2D, what we do is we have, um, we have a couple of losses. We have a reconstruction loss that basically says for every pixel um, have an L1 loss with respect to other pixel in the observed view. We can have a perceptual loss, which means um, we're just using the VGG features here um, and we don't just want to get the blurry results, which you know from another one you would get, um, as well as an adversarial loss, like in a GAN training, uh, we would also want to use these settings. Now, the key in order to make the training work here is we have to train through this whole thing end to end. And one thing that's important, we need a differentiable renderer here that goes from the 3D sparse grid to the respective 2D input images. Um, and what we do here is we have a raycast there. The raycasts our sparse volume, generates us the images, this one is differentiable because we can just raise step through. Um, and um, then we can differentiate with respect to the geometry and the color values. Okay, uh, here are some results for the color outputs. This is the input. Um, this is when we're taking L1 only. It's very blurry. If we're taking um, perceptual only, it looks less blurry, but it washes out um, the color. Um, if you're only taking adversarial, it looks sharper, but the global structures are a bit missing. And if you're combining all three of them, we're getting actually sharp and globally consistent results. So one thing about this one is interesting. This not only reconstructs color right now, but because it's differentiable, it also gives us better geometric results. And we can look at this at an evaluation study here on Matterport 3D. Uh, and we compare against occupancy networks, P4, um, SGN and synthetic only, SGN and real, and our own 3D baseline. Um, we're seeing basically that we're getting better IAUs, um, quite a bit better actually than SGN, because we now having additional color constraints, and we're getting the chamfer distance with respect to the targets um, quite a bit down. And this is actually quite nice and gives us um, better geometry because we're using the color values or the color observations as additional constraints. Um, we also quantitatively wear the color. In this case, we use FID distances. Um, we compare against P4 and texture fields, right? Texture fields is in our geometry. This is why we call it on ours. Um, and yeah, we're getting lower um, uh, inception distances, which is nice. So we're getting quite better results here. Also, visually, we have here another example. This is the input. Look at this image here. This is our geometry plus texture fields. This is ours, and this is the respective target. And here you see even like right these predictions, they look better than ours. Um, but actually, let's have a look at a video here. So in a video, this looks like that. Here we see ours, and it looks, I think, kind of nice. So now we have a high quality, high, highly fidelity reconstruction. Now, this looks all pretty good. There's still one drawback, though. All of these methods that I've shown you right now, they all run basically on a distance field. Um, and this doesn't matter whether you install the distance field right now on a, on a voxel grid or in some MLP-based implicit representation. An SDF is an implicit function by definition, and you always need to run margin cubes afterwards to get the respective outputs. And this often leads to oversmoothing results. So one idea to counteract this was, um, maybe we don't do this kind of completion and reconstruction to begin with, but rather 
um, we're doing scan to cat alignment and we're having a database of objects. We're trying to find the instances in a 3D scan and we're trying to align the respective cat models that best match this. And this project line we've, we've been working on for quite a while actually. Um, we've been trying to do this. Um, this was a paper that Yang Yang Lee did um, at Stanford in 2015 actually. Um, prior to deep learning, we use handcrafted features here. Um, and the problem statement is that we have the scan and we have this chair uh, and we want to find the best aligning cat model and then align it. But the problem is they're semantically the same, but geometrically, the local geometry is not quite the same. So you see these chair legs here are missing, but semantically it's very similar. So this makes the problem matching a little bit harder. Yeah, so one thing we've been doing, uh, we've actually uh, created the scan to cat data set. Um, so we took the scanner scenes, we annotated these scenes uh, with cat models. So we know which cat model matches best and we have the respective poses to it. In this case, we have nine DOF poses, nine DOF for uh, three for rotation, three for translation, and three for scale. Uh, we have the cat database, right? We have 3D scan and then we're gonna get the respective output. So the data set here um, is basically 97,000 key points. That's so about 100,000 key point pairs. We have the line cats. We have about 3,000 unique cats and all the scan and scenes. So we have 1,500 scenes with a lot of models aligned to it. And now we can do cool machine learning in order to train uh, our scan to cat alignment. Um, so the method we proposed here in this work was, um, first what we do is we detect, uh, so we take the geometry as input, we throw away the color, we didn't do anything with RGB at this point. Uh, we voxelize the whole thing. Um, we're detecting a bunch of key points here. And now what we're doing is um, we actually um, having uh, the having a key point here, we're having the geometry of a scan. And now we're, we're making a heat map prediction network that for this key point predicts where on the voxel grid of the cat model would this key point be. And we're running this for every cat model and for every key point, right? So next key point predicts it here. It's on the, on the bottom here, right? Um, next key point is here and so on, so, right? And we run this for every, for every cat model, for every key point. Um, and then for one cat model, we take all of these heat maps for this one cat model and we, we have this nine dot pose optimization and then we can finally align our model with respect to the target scale, right? And again, for the method here, for every CAD model, for every key point in the scene, we're predicting the heat map. So we have kind of an N squared uh, number of network runs here that predicts these heat maps. And then for every CAD model, for every set of heat maps, we run this pose optimization, including outlier detection. And so on, right? Okay, if you're looking at some of the results, so here we're comparing against FPFH, that's a handcraft feature descriptor. We compare against SHOT, it's also a handcraft feature descriptor. Um, and against this Young and Lee method that we have shown you before, against 3D match, that's a trained method, and this is our best method. So these, these are basically, these are accuracy numbers that tell us how many, of the, how many percent of the CAD models were within a certain threshold of an alignment error. So in this case, we, we were able to align 31 per, per percent of the models successfully. By the way, it's not great, it's not solved, but it's, it's a lot better than the baseline methods. It's actually a hard problem in this data set. Okay. Reconstructions uh, or alignments look like this. Here, input scan. Uh, here we see what the baselines do. They don't quite match, right? You see they don't match with the ground truth, whereas ours produces actually fairly, fairly good results with respect to the ground truth. Okay. Um, so this looks good in terms of numbers, um, but there's one big limitation. I already hinted a couple of times. Uh, so this, the runtime here is really slow. This takes about 10 minutes per scene because, again, for every cat model, uh, we have to run a network for every key point. So if we have 400 cat models and 200 key points in a scene, right? That's 400 times 200 network runs, and that's quite something. Um, and the main problem here is, of course, that the retrieval is not very efficient, meaning that we have to just brute force it, try it out for every cat model and see which one works best, right? Um, and this one is, is relatively slow, and this is something we've tried to fix afterwards. Um, this is a work we published at ICTV um, in 2019. Um, we try to do this end-to-end -end in a single forward pass in a single shot. Okay, so in this case, we have a CAD model pool. Um, we have a 3D scan and we're doing it object-centric, meaning we're running detection first. Based on the features in the detected object, we do a nearest neighbor lookup of the cats. Then we're predicting correspondences for every surface point of the scan, we're trying to find where is it on the CAD model. Um, 
And then we're running a progress method to align everything, and then we're getting some output. And one of the key contributions here is that this whole pipeline here can be run and trained into it, including the progress, which is differential. So in practice, these predictions look like these. Um, we have here the input geometry, detected object plus center predictions. Uh, here we have the occupancy, like what's on the object and what's background. That's binary. Uh, and here we have um, we have these coordinates, and we're gonna gonna call them, I'm just gonna call them correspondences for now. Each of these correspondences tell us this. These are color values. Um, Archie, they're basically x, y, and z coordinates for that tell you where in the canonical pose of the object would that correspondence predict it. So where where is that point in the 3D scan on top of the object? Right. But it's not with a heat map as we had it before. In this case, it's with the direct correspondence. Um, and these are we call these symmetry symmetry of our object coordinates. And this is kind of one of the, the key ideas. Um, there was a paper by Leo Gibas' group, um, normalized object coordinates, um, a little bit beforehand. Um, and we modified that so to deal also with symmetries. Um, and so we're basically mapping every scan voxel into the unit cube of the canonical uh, coordinate space of all objects. And this way we have correspondences and we can use them for the optimization. So network architecture-wise, this whole thing looks like that. We have here an input scan. We have an encoder-decoder structure. It's kind of like a mask arson in 3D. Uh, we're doing object detection, bounding box regression, getting an object descriptor for each box. We're getting a descriptor for every cat model, trying to do matching here, uh, retrieving the right object. We're doing the right scale in the regression. And then we're having a, these symmetry with object coordinates, um, and then we're running a progress method. And this whole thing is trained end to end, including the progress method, which is actually differential. I get this to in a second, and we'll show that this differentiability is quite important and helps quite a bit. Okay, um, the symmetries. Don't want to go into too much detail here. Basically, um, we break the the symmetry. Uh, just by predicting the aggregation through unresolved symmetries, right? So that we are trying to figure this one out. Um, and what we say is essentially every point is always consistent in the coordinate frame, right? And because of that, uh, we can do this for things like tables, which are rotation invariant, and this is actually quite crude. Okay, so for the final alignment, we then take these inputs um, and we then get these nine dot predictions, which we get here. Here we get uh, another example here. And the thing what I mentioned is this, this alignment via progress, right? The progress method has these pairs of correspondences, x and y. Uh, and we're trying to optimize for this rotation. And we're trying to solve this typically with an SVD. This is what most people do when they run a progress. Uh, and the nice thing is that an SVD is differentiable. And it's not just differentiable. Um, this functionality is already given in, in PyTorch and TensorFlow, so it's relatively easy to call. And um, this way, we can differentiate through the progress. So if you're summarizing this, we have an input scan. For the input scan, we're first detecting um, anchor centers, object detection, bounding color regression. It's kind of a 3D detection backbone. Um, then we're retrieving the CAD models for each box based on the nearest descriptive distance. We're making these symmetric object aware co uh, correspondences uh, for each box, for each voxel in each box, actually. And then we're running this differential progress and we're training this whole thing here end to end. Okay, getting results that look like these ones 3D scan. These are the baselines. This is ours. This is ground truth. So you see here, scan to cut struggles here in these regions, whereas here we look actually pretty close to the ground truth. Not perfect, but close. Um, here we have a few more scenes that also look pretty good. Here's a few more examples. Um, yeah, but maybe looking at the quantitative results is, is more interesting. So this ablation study, I think this is basically the main result of this paper. If you're doing a direct regression, you're getting about 50% of all models successfully aligned. Uh, ours final gets 50%, but what's very important is if you, let's say, you don't use this differentiable progress, and I think this is a big deal here, you only get 35, so the differentiability makes quite a big difference. If you're only using the progress, but not these correspondences, then you're getting about nine, uh, 30, which is similar order of magnitude, but not, not as good, of course. If you don't use symmetry, you're losing about 10, because it's probably the symmetric objects you're losing. But yeah. Differentiable progress, great thing. End-to-end -end differentiability learns better correspondences. Okay, we also compare against uh, the baselines again. Uh, scan to cat was at a, about 31. We are at 50 now. Still not solved, but it's a lot better. 
Um, but in addition to the accuracies, actually, what's, what's a big deal, of course, is the timings. So in, compared to scan to cat, where we had like 10 minutes per scene, we now have a single forward pass, which is like, you know, half a second to, to, to like three seconds or whatever, um, depending on how big the scenes are. Okay, yeah, so it's a lot faster, uh, about 250 x faster, over 90% more accuracy, and it's basically a fully convolutional backbone that runs in, in one shot in a forward pass. I think the scan to cat is like a super exciting direction. It's still by no means solved. Um, we learned better. One thing that would be nice is learn better fit of models. We wanted to possibly have artist interventions and learn from these ones. And we haven't talked about lighting, material, and textures, of course. So what's next? Well, generally speaking, when I give these kind of talks, I like to make this point of this, you know, 3D reconstruction and computer vision looks like that. But here we see this is Kitty. This is L. Diesel and the Spinal Fusion. Um, and these reconstructions, they get you, they, they want them to look like this in computer graphics, right? So this is like this, this kind of photorealistic reconstruction that we would love to do. Um, still a long way to go, but we're making good progress, I think, on the way. Um, yeah, so with this, I would like to come to an end. Um, I would like to thank all my collaborators, um, especially Angela Dai, who has been doing um, a lot of the completion works. Um, I would like to thank Armin Artesian who is now at Facebook, who, who was a PhD student in my group, who has done all the scan to cat stuff. Um, and I would like to, to, to thank my current group. Um, I didn't unfortunately put all the photos of my collaborators here. It always takes a while. Um, but I would like to thank all my uh, people in my group because they are doing fantastic work. And I'm just the guy here to present it at the end. So thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot for having me. And um, I hope we can show, of course, more cool new results in the near future. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs>